So now I'm excited to introduce our host. Trumpita B. Mason is currently the Philadelphia Poet Laureate. She is a recipient of a Pew Fellowship in Literature, a Leeway Transformation Award, Leeway Art and Change Grant, and Pennsylvania Council on the Arts Grants. Her work was also nominated in 20, for a 2016 Pushcart Prize. Mason is a Cave Cayman and Callaloo Fellow and a 2019 Aspen Words Emerging Writers Fellow with the Aspen Institute. She is the author of She Was Once Herself and Mocha Melodies. Mason also released two music and poetry projects, Scat and This Is How We Get Through, in collaboration with internationally acclaimed jazz guitarist Monet Sudler. Her other publications include submissions in the American Poetry Review, Epiphany Literary Journal, Aesthetica Magazine, Margie, the American Journal of Poetry, among others. Mason is a native of Liberia. She is a graduate of Temple University, Bryn Mawr Graduate School of Social Work and Social Research, and Villanova University School of Business. Currently working in the social services field, Trapita is a member of several local organizations where she uses the arts to mobilize, build community and create change. So I'm going to welcome Trapita and I will see you all in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, so hard to keep track of days today. I think it's a happy Thursday. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Julia, Laura, and um, this is a team over there um, at the Humanities Council for inviting me. So you've heard a lot in the introductions. There were a lot of layers and, and parts of me and that informs the work that I do, the work that I do in communities uh, as, an, as an artist, as a civic practitioner, as a um, a person who is a clinician working in, um, in communities in a large uh, mental health agency. And all these parts of me inform how I approach this um, community engagement. I just call it living well among our neighbors <laughs> and not trampling in communities, but really being a part of that community in a way, um, just in a way that's respectful. So in the, in, the, in the time that I have today, I'm going to share a little bit about myself and my story since so much today is about story uh, and stories. And the, the piece that I'm gonna, the, the thing that I'm gonna share are my stories through po poems. And um, I'm gonna draw from each of those um, just approaches and themes and ways that I have worked as a person who dwells in a community, works in the community, and have worked with engaging multiple people. So I, I'm gonna um, start with you the best way that I know is by sharing a poem first. And I'm gonna share my belonging poem last, but I wanna share this poem as a way to enter into um, just the first ideas or the first theme around what I feel are some of the important, thing, important things to engender a sense of belonging um, to engender positive community interactions and engagement. Um, so this piece I'm gonna read is a one that I wrote a while back and, and because we're gonna be telling stories later, um, I, this story is in the form of a letter and it's called Letter to My Sister. I have turned our childhood into a dozen verses. There are places for dramatic pause and where memory failed, I embellished a bit. You've grown impatient with me and my so-called poetic license. I don't remember that has become your wary mantra. I'm learning to excavate the good times too. Can't you see where I've colored some words and inserted those tender moments? A famous writer once said that eventually I will tire of myself and will be compelled to tell the eyeless stories. I anxiously await that moment. But for now, I want to tell him about our war with mama's illness and how at school we remained for being foreign. Remember, Dee, when they chased us up Tioga Street and accused us of having voodoo and scanned our dark bodies for tribal scars and discovered the cayenne pepper we had hidden to throw in their faces, to sting them, to make them fear us, to be left alone, to be African. Dee. 
I have managed to poem all of my pain. Tell me, what do you do with yours? So if I was in a room there, I would be able to see your faces and be able to see how you are reacting to just a little nugget of my story. And so that brings me to, there's a Nigerian writer that uh, I'm sure you all are in the library field. So you've heard of uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And if you haven't, she has this really um, wonderful TED talk. It's been viewed over 22 million times now. And it's called uh, The Danger of a Single Story. And that's really going to be the focus uh, for me, the focus on um, what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, and she, uh, Adichie says, and I'm going to quote some of the things that she said, show a people as one thing, as only one thing, and that's what they become. And that is the danger of a single story. So she talks about resisting, buying into a single story. And another quote she has is, it's impossible to talk about the single story without talking about power. Stories are defined by the principle of power or power structure, how they're told, who tells them, when they're told, how many stories are told are dependent on power. And power is the ability to not just tell the story of another person, but to make it into a definitive story, something that defines that person. And she talks about the consequences of a single story is that it robs people of their dignity. And so that, that's kind of the first piece that I want to talk about, how we, how we engender this sense of belonging. So I came to America um, as an eight-year-old, and you'll hear a little part of it in a poem that I'm going to read um, one in, in the end. So I came at the age of eight, and we uh, got on the first time, of course, first time getting on an airplane. And when we arrived here, uh, we arrived in New York. And then my parents came and we had not seen them in three years. So we were separated from them and then drove us all the way to our community um, in North Philadelphia. And in North Philadelphia um, is really, you know, Will Smith still says, West Philadelphia, you're born and raised. So I wasn't raised in West Philly, but in North Philadelphia is where I was raised along with parts of Germantown. And entering this new space, being so different um, so I would say um, it was all very strange, very overwhelming, and being able to navigate that. So how was I able to build a sense of belonging? Some of us work with children, some of us are working with young people, and at that time I had no sense of this. I had no idea. Um, as I expressed in the poem about my sister, um, was just feeling new. So as the adults, so imagine that you are the adults and you are encountering these young people, much as myself, that's an immigrant, you know, youth at the time. And the thing that I wanted the most at that time in my youth was just to feel as if someone understood my story. So how do we enter into uh, this sense of understanding people's story, um, even at that young age? Um, really giving them space to tell it. And there were many things that I feared as a youth. I feared about, you know, being foreign, being different. At the time we came in 1975, a year later or two, Alex Haley released um, the movie Roots. And before I could tell my story or build a sense of belonging in the community, everything else around me was defined. It was defined because before I could realize even who I was. So things like the characters in the story, um, all of those became my story. And the people around me um, applied that to my narrative, which wasn't necessarily my narrative. So I, I think that's the first thing about expanding. I, I wanted to use as an example of um, what Adichie is saying. Um, it's expanding that narrative. So that's the first part, not holding assumptions. Um, and as an adult or, or even as individuals in a community where you're encountering newness or you're working or you're walking into a community, being able to release yourself from the assuming um, things about people. Um, Adichie in her TED talk talks about 
the single lens, the single lens that we have. So yes, people thought, you know, every, you know, because of Tarzan, we all, you know, everybody swung on the tree. Um, we ate, you know, there were certain things that we would, um, that we ate or um, that our culture just didn't have that value. So along with um, just really wanting, not, not making assumptions, inviting people to talk about their stories, expanding that narrative, that view that you have of them. Um, I think the next step also is finding that their story has worth and has dignity. So then growing up in the school system, uh, I went to Catholic schools most, you know, most of my life. And I'm adding all these layers now of myself. This is the youth now who is the immigrant who now lives in North Philadelphia, who has his own story and his own narrative of what people think that means. Um, and then I'm adding on to going into Catholic school and learning, you know, about, you know, different parts about the religion and, um, and what that means for me as a young woman growing into my adulthood. And then going through the school system where there were very little representation of who I was. So that brings me to another point about being, you know, just making sure as we enter into the communities, as we're trying to build a sense of belonging in the community that we work with, where, what are the tools and resources that we're surrounding individuals with? Um, I didn't see, you hear many of these stories, I didn't see a lot of the things that I wanted to be a writer, um, the narrative, I didn't see too much of my story until I was well into my adulthood. Um, so as we are responsible for putting, you know, content out there, we're responsible for putting images out there, just being really mindful of what the content and the images um, represent. So I want to um, share another piece that's going to just go a little bit more into the community aspects of things and, the re and this urging to resist the single story, um, the urging to know that people's lives are expansive. So I'm going to share a piece because my family moved 13 times in my youth. Um, and it wasn't for any really tragic reason. We're an immigrant uh, a family that lived for a large part of my um, a large part of my youth and early adulthood. We were undocumented, so um, to be able to cheer for the new uh, DACA, um, you know, recipients and the folks that are being able to celebrate that—that that was me. That was my story. So we lived for a large part undocumented, almost 13 years, um, going through the court systems, um, tr uh, uh, fighting stays of, um, you know, trying to get stays of deportation. Um, so living in the shadows, um, often when we're going into these communities, particularly when everybody looks the same, whether they're all Black or all Latino or all whatever, and there we have this single lens, um, but mixed in. I mean, when people look at me, you know, from the outside, my story is just was that story of the North Philadelphia community who knew that we were undocumented and we were um, trying to be able to live our life under the shadows, but still be able to thrive as a family um, in the community. So one of the blocks um, that we lived on was called Tioga Street. Um, so I'm going to share a piece here and then I want to pull a couple of things um, that help me with this that will really be able to um, demonstrate um, the belonging, the necessity of community and how it helped me grow. So it's called to all the blocks I've lived before, North Philly. Tioga was the first to break me, dry the wet from behind my ears, cut my teeth on her concrete, took that slack out my back, introduced herself when I was eight years old and she raised me. In the late 70s, early 80s, she was a scrappy girl, blue collar but classy. Back in the day, she wore her fake grass lined porches, hanging azalea baskets, mint green metal chairs. Then came the war on drugs, then came crack, then came just say no, then came the war on us. Before then, she held traditions and rituals volleyball matches in the churchyard on Sundays, Cub Scouts and handouts, CYO dances, 4-H and Campfire Girls. She introduced me to my first bullies, 
ducked insults for being wide-nosed, dark, and foreign. Miss G told me, girl, keep that head up, skirt down, and legs closed. Tayoga was a real steady girl then. She gripped me, made me straighten and match wits, looked people in the eye, taught me how to speak up. Don't ever shrink, she commanded. This hood block produced accountants, addicts, teachers, cops, doctors, and felons who all ended up leaving her. But she grabs hold of them from time to time and she digs in deep. She is now a shell of herself, each porch holding a ghost of our past, reminding us of those early impressions, the ones that haunt and mark us, the ones we can't just rub away. So that's Sayoba. And I'm, I share this piece because um, I wanted to be able to show balance. And that's another piece about these multi-layered stories, about the importance of being able to see beyond our assumptions, about assessing our own selves when we enter into these communities to know what we're holding and what we're bringing. Because um, in the work that I've done, even in my own community in Germantown, and when I would talk to other people who were interested in either funding or supporting us, um, everybody wanted to focus on the downtrodden stories, right? The poverty numbers, the percentage of poor, the percentage of this, the percentage of that, and being able to find joy. And that's what I really wanted to reflect. When we're entering and engaging in communities, while yes, we have the struggles and the complexities of these neighborhoods, there are also joy. There's joy in the stories. There's beauty in that grandmother, grandfather, father, whatever people are doing. And I, and I urge for us not to, to, to really resist that, that one lens that says, I'm going to go in there. And Adichie talks about that too. I'm going to go in there and this is my role. I'm going to save. I'm going to help. I'm going to do this. As opposed to that other narrative that is really welcomed in communities, which is, bring what you have to the table, join what I have to this table, and then let's see how we can merge the two. Um, find joy in my existence and in my story. Okay, all right, so then I'm gonna share my last piece with you as we enter into our exercise, recipe for belonging or finding your place where you are. Take the following and mix well. One long airplane ride stretched 24 hours, 4,585 mile trip from sandy coastal plains, from rolling hills, a layer of cotton cloth, a swallow of cassava leaf and fufu and soup, a heap of colonizer remains, gutted economy, two class systems. Take a scoop of stark poverty blended with shameless wealth, a dollop of waving schoolmates and elders build, bidding farewell. A pinch of a brown girl, eight years old, mosquito-bitten arms, knocked knees and scared. Add in row houses, front porches, and stoops of North Philadelphia. Pour in newness and strangeness and foreign. Beat her mother tongue out of her. Blanch her in pop culture. Roll her in Tarzan movies and magazines with no models. Soak her in it all until she is raw to the bone. Dredge her in every history except her own. Let it marinate until tender, then coat and dust her, sprinkle with the glitter of this place. Cover and bake in an inferno, an open fire. Create a flambe, see her rising above it all. Take the lid off, see her shell cracking, see her shedding, see her drippings and her renderings. She won't be minced and diced and pureed and poached on. She is an awesome stew, she won't be reduced. She has found her place where she is. She is who she is. See the core of her, the marrow that can't be sucked out. Join her feast. See what she brings to the table. Don't fold into your own plate. Don't take more than your share. Don't eat it all up with no leavings. Don't grate on her nerves. Adjust yourself. Sit at the table with all of your manners. Chop it up. Peel back in differences, sift through nonsense and assumptions, sweat and steam if you have to, boil, braise, and brew if you have to, then chill. Know that her palate is exquisite too, is garnished and glorified too. Now sit back and chew. Thank you.